Welcome to today's Global Connections program. I'm Bill Miller. Today we're going to take a look at a very monumental treaty that was recently adopted at the United Nations to ban nuclear weapons. This has the potential to reduce and perhaps even eliminate nuclear weapons in the not too distant future. My guest today is an expert on this topic. My guest today is John Burroughs. Mr. John Burroughs is the executive director of the New York-based Lawyers Committee on Nuclear Policy. John, welcome to today's Global Connections program. Glad to be here. I appreciate you being with me today. I mentioned in the opening about nuclear weapons, and we've been dealing with nuclear weapons since, I guess, the weapons, the atomic bombs were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki in 1945. It, this has been a really a, a naughty issue to deal with. Uh, tell me about this new treaty that just came out, the new ban that was adopted, I guess, July 7th, 2017, to eliminate nuclear weapons, is that correct? Not quite. It's uh, formally called the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. And as its label indicates, it's focused on prohibitions. Prohibitions mm -hmm. of development, testing, manufacture, use, and threatened use of nuclear weapons. Thus, the Prohibition Treaty. But it also does have provisions which would allow countries that have nuclear weapons to join the treaty, providing they agree to a time-bound format for the verified elimination of their nuclear arsenals. Unfortunately, no nuclear armed states were involved in its negotiation or its adoption. So it's initiative of the non-nuclear weapon states of the world. Now these, debates, uh, these discussions, I should say, have been going on for decades, I guess, dealing with nuclear weapons. Now, you're the director of the Lawyers Committee on Nuclear Policy. What role, well, first off, what is that Lawyers Committee on Nuclear Policy? What role did it play in this whole discussion dealing with this particular treaty? Uh, lawyers Committee on Nuclear Policy is a nonprofit association of lawyers and legal scholars uh, formed in 1981. And before I came here in 1999, it was involved in an effort to get an advisory opinion on the legality of nuclear weapons from the International Court of Justice. And most relevant to the Nuclear Ban Treaty, uh, Lawyers Committee coordinated the drafting of a model treaty to prohibit and eliminate nuclear weapons. It was based upon a treaty which exists to prohibit it and eliminate chemical weapons, the uh, Chemical Weapons Convention. Uh, so this effort to get a nuclear ban treaty started about five years ago with uh, conferences held by the governments of Norway, Mexico, and Austria on the humanitarian consequences of nuclear weapons. Then it turned into a, a UN process and there were negotiations this year culminating in the adoption on July 7th. My organization, like other civil society organizations, including the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons, uh, we um, were active in numerous ways. <clears throat> we prepared working papers. Uh, I served on expert panels that, that were part of the conference. We made civil <laughs> society statements to the negotiations. And uh, one of the features of these negotiations in the countries who led this effort, uh, notably Austria, Ireland, Mexico, Brazil, South Africa, they were really very open to and collaborated with uh, civil society. So I think we and other uh, non-government organizations had some influence on the way the treaty turned out. Uh, apparently it was a group effort <laughs> and it paid mm -hmm. off in the end. This is such an important treaty. As you mentioned, there were, uh, well, there were, I think what right now there are nine nuclear states, nine countries that yes. have nuclear weapons, and they did not participate in this particular debate or this treaty. What, first off, what are the nine states and why did they not participate? Well, it's the five permanent members of the Security Council uh, the United States, uh, Britain, France, Russia, and China, plus India, Pakistan, Israel, and North Korea. Now, interestingly, 
China showed some interest in participating in the negotiations. And if they had, probably India and Pakistan would have as well. Mm -hmm. But they eventually decided not to. I'm not saying they would have signed on to it, but it was entirely possible for the nuclear armed states and also their allies like NATO for the United States, NATO allies, uh, Australia, Japan, uh, they could have participated but not signed on to the final product. And in fact, that's what uh, the Netherlands did. Well, their rationale for not participating is that they are engaged, so they say, in a step-by-step -step process towards the elimination of nuclear weapons like the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, a Fissile Materials Treaty to be negotiated, uh, U.S.-Russian reductions, and the like. And they say this is a <laughs> slow, painful, incremental process which essentially will take decades. So it's not appropriate, they say, to have a treaty which sets out to uh, set in motion a fairly rapid process, by comparison anyway, of elimination of nuclear weapons. Now, if I can tell you the reply of the non-nuclear weapon states, they say, well, that's all fine and good. But it's been more than 70 years since the first United Nations General Assembly resolution called for the elimination of atomic weapons, as they were called then, and other weapons of mass destruction. It's been since 1970 <coughs> since the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty entered into force. That contains a promise of disarmament, which the non-nuclear weapon states say that the nuclear weapon states are not fulfilling. So we sort of have a, a clash of views here between, in essence, the global south and the most powerful countries in the world. Mm -hmm. Now, you mentioned the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, which is a major, major agreement. That, as I recall, that Articles 4 and 6, uh, I may be off on those articles, but those do require that the nuclear powers work to actually reduce their nuclear stockpiles and also to provide technical assistance to the non-nuclear states. Does, is that That's correct. <coughs> Article 6 provides that each of the parties to the treaty uh, is obligated to pursue negotiations in good faith on effective measures related to uh, cessation of the nuclear arms race at an early date and to nuclear disarmament and a treaty on general complete disarmament. So it is somewhat vague, but it has been made more concrete over uh, the process of non-proliferation treaty meetings, uh, review mm -hmm. process. And uh, so in the context of the review process, the nuclear weapon states that are party to the treaty, which is the permanent five, uh, mm -hmm. <coughs> India, Pakistan, uh, Israel, North Korea are, are all, all outside the treaty. The permanent five agreed to, for example, an unequivocal undertaking to eliminate their nuclear arsenals. Uh, so <coughs> the non-nuclear weapon state treaties, again, they're saying you've made promises in the context of mm -hmm. the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. You're not fulfilling them. We are going to negotiate and bring into force this nuclear ban treaty to stimulate the process, uh, shall we say. Mm -hmm. uh, Article mm -hmm. 4, you al also mentioned of the Non-Proliferation Treaty. That uh, enshrines a right to peaceful uses of nuclear energy and commits uh, the country, uh, countries to, or gives countries the right to receive assistance with peaceful uses of nuclear energy. Mm -hmm. What, how will this treaty affect the nine countries, especially the five members of the Security Council that are nuclear states? Will they at some point try to get them to be involved in this, or how will they come back and work with them in, in the future? Because this, this treaty comes into effect when, what, 50 states ratify it in their own particular countries? 50 of the 122, is, is that the correct figure? Or? That's correct, and it's gonna open for signature September 20th here at the United Nations, 
And then it will take some period of time, let's say a year, mm -hmm. maybe it'll be longer than that, for 50 states to take the subsequent step of ratifying uh, the treaty. Once it enters into force, within a year there will be a meeting of states' parties and then there will be every two years meetings of states' parties. So it's set up to have a process uh, to oversee implementation of the treaty. Now, as far, so far as the countries that have nuclear weapons, the reception of the U.S., Britain, and France was not very positive. They made a statement, a joint statement. <coughs> Maybe it was the day of adoption, but it was right around the day of adoption, July 7th, where they said, uh, this treaty is irrelevant to the problems of, of nonproliferation, such as North Korea acquiring nuclear weapons. It overlooks the fact that so-called nuclear deterrence is a basis for international security, and we are pursuing you know, a step-by-step -step process of disarmament in the context of, of the NPT. And they said, we are never going to join this treaty. So they had a very strong negative reaction to it. Well, you know, things change over time, and uh, the countries that were leading this nuclear ban treaty initiative, they have always tried quite hard mm -hmm. to engage constructively with uh, the nuclear armed states and with their allies, the NATO allies, uh, Australia, Japan, etc. And I'm sure that they will continue to do so and the treaty is set up so that should a nuclear armed state or some of them or all of them decide they want to disarm, they could do so pursuant provision to provisions in the treaty that provide for the verified mm -hmm. and irreversible elimination of, of their arsenals. In any case, the treaty is there as a model of what should be done if the nuclear armed states are going to fulfill their obligation of negotiating nuclear disarmament. Mm -hmm. Years ago we used to hear about MAD, the Mutually Assured Destruction Theory. This was the idea, I guess, that countries with nuclear weapons would not use them because we, nobody is going to survive a nuclear exchange. From what I understand, that seems to be the prevailing philosophy. Is that still a tenable theory today? No. <coughs> But uh, I, I think that it was always too risky a basis for, for international security. But it's gotten uh, more risky in, in recent years. Uh, there was a thought that after the Soviet Union disintegrated uh, and there was a flurry of arms control in the 1990s, the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty was negotiated. The Non-Proliferation Treaty was indefinitely extended. The Chemical Weapons Convention mm -hmm. was negotiated. There were U.S.-Russian re reductions. There was a thought that the U.S. and Russia were on a path to decreasing and eventually ending their reliance on nuclear arms. And uh, President Obama, in <coughs> uh, a speech in Prague in 2009, in a way, he tried to revive this vision of, of the 1990s, but he, uh, he met only very uh, limited success. So now we have a situation where the U.S. and Russia are still relying on their nuclear weapons and they can each destroy the other mm -hmm. country if should they decide to do so, and they can do that. I'm sorry to tell you, they can do that in a matter of minutes, even now, as we speak right now. Uh, but there are also tensions between India and Pakistan, which are building up their arsenals. There are tensions between uh, India and China over their border. Uh, everybody is hearing about North Korea's buildup of its nuclear arsenal. Uh, so a lot of well-informed observers are saying that the risks have returned. In <laughs> fact, they might even be greater than they were during the Cold War. Mm -hmm. Well, you're watching Global Connections Television, which is a privately funded, independently produced program. The opinions expressed on Global Connections are solely those of the moderator and his guest. We would invite our guest viewers to go to our website 
at www.globalconnectionstelevision.com to view previous programs. Also, if you're involved with any type of community access television station, PBS station, or you're involved with an educational institution that has an intra campus television hookup, or you just have a website and you'd like to share our programs, please feel free to download them. Global Connections Television is provided free of charge as a public service to help us better understand international issues. Today we're talking about one of the, really one of the major international issues, and that's nuclear proliferation. And my guest today is an expert bringing us up to date on a very monumental United Nations treaty that was adopted on July 7th of this year. My guest today is Mr. John Burroughs. John Burroughs is the executive director of the New York-based Lawyers Committee on Nuclear Policy. John, we're talking about the, the dangers of nuclear weapons. And as I recall, there have been at least 12 documented cases and probably many more that we don't know about since 1945 where there were almost accidental exchanges between the former Soviet Union and the United States. How, how severe is this problem? How can we get, without reducing or eliminating nuclear weapons, how can we reduce that possibility of an accidental exchange? Well, you know, the, the risk of an accidental uh, uh, nuclear explosion is a serious one. I'll, I'll say something about that. But I, I think that the risk of deliberate use of nuclear weapons is overlooked. Uh, the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists recently moved their famous doomsday clock to two and a half days to midnight. Two and a half minutes. Sorry, two and a half mi uh, minutes to midnight. And uh, they did that in part because they think the world is not adequately addressing the problem of climate change. But they also did it because they think the risk of deliberate use of nuclear weapons is going up in some of the flashpoints that I mentioned earlier. Korean Peninsula, South Asia, possibly U.S., Russia. Uh, but it, it is true that there is and there always has been a risk of accidental use or explosion of nuclear weapons. And uh, the scientists, and there are a lot of them in the field, they will tell you, well, you know, if you have a small risk and you allow it to continue <laughs> over a very long period of time, eventually it's going to happen. Uh, <coughs> and so there have been instances uh, where nuclear weapons were lost, fell off of uh, aircraft, and so on. And they're fairly well documented in the case of, of the United States, but we don't really know what has happened in Russia mm -hmm. or the other nuclear armed states. So that's certainly an aspect of the problem. Um, an another really troubling aspect is the problem of false warning of an incoming attack. Mm -hmm. And you know, the United States uh, has had more than one uh, uh, test uh, uh, indication of an incoming attack which was taken very seriously and, you know, could have been acted upon. So that's mm -hmm. another aspect of the risk. Mm -hmm. Before we run out of time, I want to talk about, about a very interesting case that was pending, or was actually being discussed before the International Court of Justice, the World Court. And that has to do with the Marshall Islands. You were involved in that. Just give a brief background on why the Marshall Islands is so involved in trying to take action against folks who are using nuclear weapons or possibly have used them? This uh, <coughs> uh, is a subject uh, dear to my heart. I was really privileged to be on the international legal team for the Marshall Islands and to work with their incredible foreign minister, or then foreign minister, Tony uh, De Bruyne. Uh, the Marshall Islands brought the cases against all nine countries with nuclear weapons at the International Court of Justice in 2014 claiming that they had not fulfilled their obligation to negotiate nuclear disarmament under the Non-Proliferation Treaty and also under general international law. Uh, the reason it had to be under general international law is that uh, four of the nine countries, India, Pakistan, Israel, and North Korea, are not parties to the Non-Proliferation Treaty. And uh, so basically the Marshall Islands said there's this obligation, and yet there are no multilateral negotiations on nuclear disarmament. We've been talking in this program about 
There were multilateral negotiations on nuclear disarmament just this year at the United Nations, but the nuclear powers refused to participate. So the Marshall Islands had a very strong case on the merits in the, in the International Court of Justice, and I think we would have had a, a good outcome had the cases reached the merits. Unfortunately, uh, there were only three of the cases that were actually adjudicated by the court because they were countries that accepted the compulsory jurisdiction of the court. That's India, Pakistan, the United Kingdom. The court eventually decided by the narrowest of margins, eight to eight, uh, with the president of the court casting the deciding vote, uh, that the cases would not go forward to the merits because the court said a dispute, a legal dispute, had not been sufficiently established before uh, the cases were, were brought to the court. Well, I think there was some reluctance on, on, on the part of some of the judges to deal with the problem, but the International Court of Justice may yet again be involved uh, mm -hmm. because they uh, gave an advisory opinion on legality of threat or use of nuclear weapons in 1996, requested by the UN General Assembly, and they could be asked for such an advisory opinion again, and mm -hmm. the nuclear mm -hmm. ban treaty would provide a good foundation for that. It certainly would. Mm -hmm. John, the hardest question in the last minute and a half that we have left, Russia is talking about updating its nuclear stockpile. The United States is talking about modernizing their nuclear weapons. They were talking about figures of a trillion dollars. That's ballpark, probably bottom basement, bottom figures. Mm. Is this not a good time for them to say, let's see how we can reduce these stockpiles and put that money into other things such as infrastructure development, into education, into health, whatever it may be. But it seems like this would be an optimal time because these nuclear weapon systems are old, they're creaky, they're dangerous, and even more accidents could happen. That is a very good question. I, I don't agree with your last point. I think both countries are doing a fairly good job of keeping their nuclear systems uh, going, although there have been some reports about how they're using you know, outdated uh, equipment of various Computers. kinds. Computers. <laughs> yes. yes. Uh, uh, but we're talking about professionals here. Mm -hmm. uh, but it is true that the United States is, uh, the Trump administration carrying forward plans of the Obama administration is projected to spend over a trillion dollars over the next three day decades on maintaining and modernizing nuclear forces and mm -hmm. infrastructure. Mm -hmm. You know, submarines, missiles, bombers, these are expensive and the fleets are gonna have to be uh, replaced. The same sort of thing is, is going on in Russia. Uh, so uh, when the Trump administration came in, I thought, my organization thought, well, maybe this will be an opportunity for uh, creation of a better relationship uh, with Russia, which could um, <coughs> create an environment for further nu nuclear arms control between uh, the two countries. Uh, and you know there are some outstanding issues. The existing uh, reduction treaty between the two countries will need to be extended in a few years. But uh, really, the country should be going to very, very low levels to, to lay the basis for worldwide elimination of, of nuclear weapons. Well, as we all know, uh, the the uh, Trump administration has run into problems uh, re of various kinds regarding Russia, so it doesn't seem that there's going to be an improvement of rela relations in the near future. Nonetheless, it's important for them to come to this, grips with the this problem. This is a very important issue we need mm. to learn more about. And our viewers can go to your website at lcnp.org, or they can go to un.org, or they can just Google. United Nations Treaty to ban or reduce or contain nuclear weapons, whatever it might be. But this is such an important topic, and the weapons we're talking about today are hundreds, thousands of times more powerful than the bombs that were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki in 1945. And if we ever did have some type of exchange, a nuclear winter would just be absolutely devastating, not to mention the tens and perhaps hundreds of millions of people who would be killed. But John Burroughs, I want to thank you so very much for a very interesting and a very informative program. Yeah, I was glad to be with you. Thank you. I'm Bill Miller. Thank you for joining us today on Global Connections Television.